two people, f um, well, we have Ansys Agnew's director of Forest Dale, um, Stephanie Hooker at Lutheran Family Services, Lutheran Social Services, I'm sorry, Dana Guyette from ACS, Shanine Bryant, who is a parent advocate at Children's, Children's Aid Society, and Felicia Elaine Davis, who is a parent advocate at New Alternatives for Children. Um, I want to start with um, a question for the two parent advocates. You know, and this speaks to integration, I think. Did, did the training, did, did learning how to do this work change your perspective and your outlook on the child welfare system and on the agencies that you had dealt with for years as a parent? One of you? First. Either one of you. Okay. Um, the training that we had through CWAP was a six-month intensive training. Um, and your question is, was my perception changed yeah. throughout the training? And your outlook on, on what child welfare system, the well, system is and the agency's role. Well, actually, when my son was in foster care, when my son was first taken, there was no one there to help me. I did all my legwork. So some of the things that we were trained on in the six months, I was already privy to right. because I did my research. Um, the agency's perception of the parent advocate in the beginning, um, I think there was like a tough pill to swallow from being client to colleague, as you said earlier. Um, the upper management at the agency was well, they received me very well mm -hmm. with open arms. When it came down to the supervisors and the case planners, it was like, wait a minute, there was a brick wall. What exactly are you here to do? Are you here to side with the parents against us? I'm like, no, I'm here to level out the playing field. I'm here to give the parents a voice. Parents need to be heard because they have rights too. And it was so funny, the first family team conference that I sat on was actually with the case planner I had in my case. You know, So that was rough. And it was like, we want you to sit here, be seen and not heard. And I'm fuming. You know, because this parent kept saying, I need help, I need help, I need help. When I go to interject to something, I was being shut down. I immediately went to upper management, and they put a stop to that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and having that support at that agency helped. Now, they call me all the time. <laughs> you know, my caseload is so huge. I'm so, I, I feel that I'm needed at the agency. Our agency is very unique. The agency that my son was with, New Alternatives for Children, my son has cerebral palsy. And while my son was in forced to, well, while my son was born at 23 weeks, he was severely premature. And throughout the whole time of parenting him, it was very difficult for me because there was nothing out there. I kept asking for help. You know, what should I expect from my son? What can I do to help him work to the fullest of his potential? And no one was there to help. You know, I lost my job of 20 years, and my husband got, was incarcerated, and, you know, I had lost my house. My son needed all of these surgeries, and we ended up upstate at a hospital for him to do rehab. And then when they had to kick us out after nine months, you know, I took a long, hard look, and, and I decided to go into a New York City shelter system, and I stayed there for two years trying to advocate to get wheelchair-accessible housing for my son. And throughout that time, I became so overwhelmed. Um, that I felt like I was drowning. Mm -hmm. And I just kept asking for help, and no, I, all my pleas fell on deaf ears. You know, even as far as getting um, an apartment in New York City Housing Authority, I wrote every congressperson, assembly mm -hmm. person, senator, governor, everyone. You know, even wrote Tino Hernandez, was the chairman of New York City Housing Authority at the time. I wrote him numerous letters, yeah. you know, so it was very hard. So having a child with special needs, being at my agency, and telling a parent, that yes, my son was in foster care, and guess what? My son has special needs, and guess what? It was this agency that I'm with now. They look at me, they said, you gotta be kidding. Mm -hmm. You working for the agency that took your son? Right. Says, no, the agency didn't take my son. You know, due to my inability to accept my personal responsibilities, I actually created my own problems. Mm -hmm. That's why my son was in foster care. ACS didn't come knock on my door. I gave them every reason to, you know, but it was my determination to turn that around. Because I look like an absolute horror on paper, and I know I did. <laughs> you know, so it's so important for the case planners and the social workers and the FCL, FCLS attorneys to see the parent for who they are and not just what they read. Right. Yeah. Yeah.
Did I Shin- answer your question? Sh- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, Shanine. Yes. Janine Bryant, do you want to talk a little bit about that question, too, about how did this whole process change you and, and, and the way you understood oh, wow. the system and its effect on parents' lives and children's lives? Wow. Um, my perspective. Hi. Good morning, everybody, first. <laughs> and happy to see you guys. Um, my perspective, um, when I was Children's Aid Society and my child was in medical foster care, due to medical um, problems that my child had at the time. Like the agency, the way how I see them then, I see them now, how they treat me then, it's like they treat me the same way now. And just like Felicia said, um, transitioning from a client to a worker um, and letting them know that I'm not here to like change the, or. Here she comes, she, she's oh, the parent advocate, because that's what people think, the parent advocate, oh God, here comes trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not what, you know, my agency, you know, in all units, that's not how my agency welcomed me, you know. Um, I let them know who I, you know, a, a lot of them knew who I was. A lot of them saw me in that lobby, workers. A lot of them came up to me. A lot of them welcomed me with open arms, and that's the way they do now. And I, and you know, and that's that's what makes it very easy, you know, for for me. And I just let them know, like, you know, I'm I'm here to help. I'm here to help. You know, I had three children in the system, and one, you know, came to medical foster care, foster care agency, and like, you know, just me looking at my life in the past and looking at my life now and looking at my life from where I was just visiting in that visiting room, supposed to seeing another parent visiting in that visiting room. Like, I don't want to never forget, like, I know how that parent feels, you know? So I always, I always make it my business to go and see how that parent is doing, to ask them, are they okay? Because simple words are, are, are you okay? That means a lot. You know, like just starting right there makes a difference in right. the agency. Um, and as far as trainings, I did a lot of trainings with CWAP. And, you know, and something that one of the um, trainers said back there, who's a part of the parent ad, um, advocate um, training now, yes, I am the one in my agency and my supervisor can tell you, I take all of CWAP's pamphlets, literature, and I like, I give it out. I put it on units. I, um, I promote CWAP to my parents. I let them know that this is a place outside of this place that's for them, that I'm near, that I will walk them through. You know, um, back with the trainings, um, I have done a lot of trainings with CWAP, as well as um, interning at my agency while I was training with CWA because it was a part of the curriculum at the time. Right. And um, my, my supervisor put me like in a whole bunch of trainings too. And then no, it wasn't overwhelming because I was open. I was on fire. I was ready to learn. And I had no problem saying, I don't understand this. Because see, I know my part is that my experience, right? But I had to get to know the other parts, like the legals and, and different the lawyers and, uh, and uh, um, different court uh, uh, fact finders and all these different phrases. And I was like, you know, even though I went through it, but I was still type like an illiterate to it. But I thank God for all the trainings that my agency and CWAP has offered me because it's making me more today, you know, in ongoing trainings. My supervisor told me there's a training. Sign me up for it. Right. I mm-hmm. want it now all to right. help my parents to understand. Great. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Dana Guyette, from working within government with parent advocates, it's a bit different from integrating parent advocates into the agencies, but you have a dual role here, right? I mean, you're supporting the agencies and the parent advocates getting into the agency, but you're also working with parent advocates within ACS. Can you talk a little bit about what it, what it, how it has, um, what are the lessons you've learned in terms of the most effective ways of integrating parent advocates into your work and into the work of the agency? I mean, I think as, um as other speakers on the previous panel and this panel have mentioned is there really does have to be a structure of support and commitment and directed energy 
to do this well. So I think that at ACS, the parent advocates have been based in the Office of Advocacy, which makes a lot of sense because the Office of Advocacy is responding to concerns from the client community, families, parents, foster parents, youth, other concerned individuals. So that was a really natural fit for the parent advocates and there was also a really directed structure around the program of supervision, of training, and support. And of course, the support started with Commissioner Mattingly, which sends a huge message to the agency in terms of the value and commitment to the parent advocate role. And I think that we really tried to embody that in the parent advocate initiative, which was to not just try to fund parent advocate positions, but to recognize everything that goes into making it successful so that it, you know everyone is gung-ho and excited and then it gets going and the parent advocate might feel isolated or confused or overwhelmed and no one in the agency is really <coughs> recognizing and, and, and structured to address that. Mm -hmm. So I think that the agencies who have been able to do this effectively have really been thoughtful about that process, about the support needed and the attention needed to the support for the parent advocate um, as well as the training and the support for the rest of the staff to use the parent advocate in the most effective manner in terms of what the special skills and insight that they bring to the work. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Ansys Agnew, at Forestdale, what are the elements, I mean, you've, you've had advocates now for how many years working with Forestdale? Three, four years. Three or four um, years. So, so what have been the most essential elements of, of that structure um, in terms of integrating them into the work? Um, I agree with the person who said that upper management um, usually doesn't have a problem. I find myself spending a lot of time calling the caseworkers and the supervisors and asking them if they have involved the parent advocates. And I usually hear, no, I didn't think about that. For me, I have um, Albert Shepard is sitting right over there. He is a young man who is an um, advocate. He's one of my guardian angels. I have two of them at the agency. And when I go out on events, cultivation events, or to advocate in Albany, who do I take? I take this man right over here with me. Because he can speak better than I can, better than anybody can. And I think that changing culture, it just takes a long time. People come into the field as caseworkers. They look at what, what's happened. Okay, these parents are bad parents. They abused and neglected their kids. And so they're skeptical mm -hmm. of people who are gonna be working in the system who have had their children taken away. And I think we have to change that. And we are changing it, but it takes time. And then I just wanna put in a plug. I think these advocates need to get their bachelor's degrees. If they don't, I think we need to pay for that. Oh, that would be nice. And I, I think that they can be the leaders in the future. And um, I'm sure there's money in this room and in the city to see that we get scholarships for our advocates. Stephanie Hooker, um, can you talk about some of the expectations of, of staff at your agency, sort of what do they expect from the parent advocates and what are they, um, sort of, are, are the expectations set too high, set too low, um, that kind of thing. And what are some of the other conflicts that arise and how to solve them? Um, well, I would definitely echo what um, Anstis. Anstis, thank you, it indicated about the, at times, case planner reluctance to get a parent advocate involved. And I think that there does need to be more of a cultural change. I think this is still new. Um, even at our agency, we've had a parent advocate since 2006, and there is still some resistance. When a parent advocate gets involved, sometimes a case planner is looking at a case one way, and that's somebody else coming involved and challenging the direction they're going in and asking questions. And um, so I think they're, uh, well, that's something that we're aware of and we're working on every day, and we try to think of new ways to get parent advocate our parent advocate involved in every case that she can, mm -hmm. um, sitting in on FTCs, covering parent-child visits, going to court, sitting in on parent-to-parent -parent meetings, um, sending introductory letters to every parent we have, but we know that that's just one other letter um, that they receive on our letterhead. Mm -hmm. um, some other um, challenges, I guess, would be 
or one of the ways that we've been trying to combat some of these challenges is by having the parent advocate in our aftercare unit, which may be a little unique um, to the other agencies. And that's because the parent advocate, it's helpful for us to have a supervisor who's not the supervisor of the case planner so that it doesn't create that conflict. If a supervisor is directing a case in a certain direction and then the parent advocate is coming to them and, and saying, you know, I, I'm giving you a different perspective. Maybe we can go in this direction or maybe the case planner is not doing this or um, it's helpful for them to have their own supervisor who can then intervene a little more objectively or diplomatically so that the parent advocate can continue to do their job and not be seen as an adversarial mm -hmm. within the agency. Um, I also think CWAP has been tremendously uh, crucial, supportive, both for our parent advocates, but for the agency staff as well. Okay. So I applaud them. Yeah. Andrew, I just wanted to, to that point, uh, mention that I think the other piece that is important in terms of having some senior administration involved with the parent advocate work is to be able to make the connection where it fits, whether because people don't think of it as Anston's mentioned or just don't know. I mean, at an agency as large as ACS, there are a lot of people that don't know about other things going on. And so if I hear about something going on where there's a, where there's a logical, natural fit for parent advocates to be involved, I can then reach out. And you know, inevitably, the response is, oh my gosh, the parent advocates were amazing. They, they you know, helped us understand this differently and brought so much to the table. And they wouldn't have been involved if there wasn't that connection of something that I'm aware of, but that they weren't aware of, mm -hmm. that the two parties on both ends weren't aware of. And so I think that the um, supervisors and directors can make that connection of where they fit within the system. And, and then once you do that, you know, forget about it. Everyone is contacting you for the parent advocates. So, you know, everyone wants a piece of them, and there's never enough parent advocates to go around. Um, but I think that once people get exposed to them and their work and their stories and their perspective, they then want to bring them into things so that they can broaden the exposure that other people have. Mm -hmm. Answers. I just wanted to say one more thing. I, I, I'm lucky or unlucky to be presenting along with um, Arlene Goldsmith for Childstat uh, next oh, week. Yeah. And I was reviewing the case, and I want, I want to tell you who made the most attempts to find the mother, without a doubt. That birth parent advocate made 10 visits trying to find her in, in the course of seven days. I'd never seen anything like it. It was just right there. And I have found that with all the birth parent advocates. They, they go the distance. They don't stop. I think they are in danger of getting burned out. But boy, oh boy, you just can't match their work. Felicia, um, do you see a, a very clear change in the culture of your organization as a result of your work? Yes, um, definitely. Um, it's constantly evolving, but there is a change. Um, as I said in the beginning, there was some resistance to my being, to my being there. Because granted, when my son was in forced care with NAC, um, I was hell on wheels. You know, I was very difficult um, to work with. Um, so I did give my case plan a rough time. Um, so it was so amazing that when I got that telephone call um, at, with the job offer, I mean, I immediately started to cry, you know, because they saw the hard work that I, that I did. And I, I understood coming in that there was some, gonna be some resistance because it's new. Change is hard. I get that. But it was by my determination and um, steadfastness to show the social workers or the case planners, I'm not here to side against you. I'm not here to put you down. I'm here to uplift the parents and you as well. Yeah. I'm here to level out the playing ground. I'm here to, 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 to um, make, the, make the, the process of having someone affected with child welfare as smooth as possible. You know. Um, has there been some change? Yes, there has. For instance, um, as I said, you know, when my son was in foster care, I needed help. Um, I, oh, I, ne I knew I needed someone to talk to that I can identify with. Um, just like the gentleman said, there, there are no very small, a uh, little bit of programs that's out there for parents with children on special needs. 
I know I needed somebody that I could relate to that had a child with special needs, and there wasn't anything out there. So one of the, main, one of the things I did at my agency that I got resistance from, again, not from upper management, mm -hmm. but from the social workers and their supervisors, is that I started a support group for parents with children of special needs. Now, at NAC is unique, because we have two sides of the house. We have foster care and we have preventive services. So I wanted to combine the groups, and they were like, oh no. You can't mix the two populations. Right. Right. You know, they, they, they're not going to relate to each other. But why not? The common denominator is, is that we all have children with special right. needs. Right. And do you know, <laughs> and do you know that was one of the largest groups that NAC has ever had? Right. You know, and they're asking me to do it again. And it's, and it's needed. Um, as I said, there are two sides of the house, prevention and forced to care. And some days I feel like I need roller skates you know, for all the, the places that I have to be, you know, and it's unfortunate that the budget is so small because we do need two, at right. least two advocates, and one that is um, bilingual, yeah. you know, that's needed as well. Um, I'm being asked on um, case, case reviews. They ask me my opinion on a case review. Oh my gosh, I'm sitting amongst all these people who have the alphabet soup behind their name, and you're asking me my opinion? You know, that, that was just such a high. You know, I'm being called. Um, uh, could you come with me on this home visit? Well, Felicia, what do you think about this case? You know, and I'm sitting back and I'm like, wow. Just a couple of years ago, I was sitting on the other side of the table. And now you're asking me what I think? Right. Wow. Right. So yes, there has been a change and it's constantly evolving. That's great. Um, Stephanie, one of the things that came out of the Chapin Hall review is that um, a lot of the supervisors preferred being able to use the advocates where they were needed, like flexible use of them rather than giving them a caseload and making them just manage that caseload. I mean, is that true? I mean, is that something that agencies should be coming into this with is a much broader sense of how to um, employ parent advocates? Well, I don't know about um, if it's how it should happen, mm -hmm. but at Lutheran Social Services, we have been utilizing parent advocates in that way without having a specific caseload. Um, the cases that they're working on are constantly um, being tracked so that during supervision they're discussing the cases, but the cases that they're working on are constantly changing on depending on the needs of the parents. Um, and I think that that flexibility has been helpful for us so that uh, the, the one parent advocate that we have can work with the families that need them most when they need them. Right. Um, but, you know, I would be curious to hear uh, um, from agencies that do have caseloads, if that's helpful in any way. I mean, I think that for us, the way this has been working, um, but I don't right. know if I okay. would say it should happen that way. Anstis, what's your take on that? Well, I was just looking over at Albert because he's the expert. So, Albert, would you like to say something? Yes. Mike's right there. Sure. Basically, um, the agency has six different units, and within those six units is two advocates. Two advocates, three units apiece. And when one advocate is gone, that means the other one's there with six units. But it doesn't matter because any parent that comes in, if my coworker is not there or if I'm not there and my coworker is there, there's a parent that comes in, we know who's new. They could just walk on that compound, we know who's new before they even meet with the case planner. <laughs> we see them, how you doing? You're going to meet the case planner, let's go. And then I'm going to explain everything to you in front of your case planner. Ninety percent of the case planners at my agency <coughs> have no problem calling on the advocates. Uh, between the other ten percent, you have half of them that are territorial, and the other half that still don't know which way is up. <laughs> <laughs> but I like them because they get the job done. You know. Um, the thing is, we run into resistance. I can, have, I can have one of the we don't know which way is up case planners who will say, okay, we can try this. But then we run into the resistance because we have to answer the ACS. And ACS says, no, we can't try this. Okay, now we got to fight it out in court. You know, so I might have mama with me, but then we got to go to Big Papa later. You know, either way, we're still there. It doesn't matter how many parents come in, who comes in me and another advocate cover. So it's not specifically a caseload, rather it's just balancing, the, balancing everything that comes through. Right. Thank you, Albert. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Shanine. Hi, just to um, feedback what, what Albert said, um, 
Like, in my unit, because there's one advocate on my unit, which is me, and there's three units, but however, I still let the parents know that I am here, right? But on my unit, what happens is that I get the intakes, right? And um, I get in contact with the, uh, with the caseworker to let me know when that transitional meeting is going to happen so I can sit on that transitional meeting to meet that parent. I stress the importance of the parent to parent. I like to go over the uh, dialogue with the new parents to let them know that there is a parent advocate. What I do is, too, I will send out my introduction letter. I send out, uh, when they come in on their first visit, because they have a, a medical appointment, so usually their first medical appointment is usually the first time that the parents will try to make it on the same day. I put together a whole bunch of goodies, which I have is the um, knowing your rights and a whole bunch of other stuff for them and letting them let it be the option if they would like to utilize me. Not even so that I don't have to work with them on a, uh, every time that they come in, but just to go to court, be supportive at court. If they have a meeting, if they need help with HRA, if they need help with any other type of outside community organizations or anything like that, that I am there. As my supervisor said, I will drop to a nail, and if a caseworker needs me right now, right now, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll go there. Right. You know, and Great. that's how I work. All right, so we have a few minutes again for Q&A. Allison, you want to grab a mic here? And, and um, where's Anna? Yeah. Okay, so over here. Every, I'm going to go through three questions quickly so that we get three different people and then we'll have response. And keep these questions short or I'm going to interrupt, unfortunately, because we don't have a lot of time. I'd like to know, I think the parent advocates are great. Um, I think it's wonderful. I'd like to know what is there for somebody like me. There has to be services for the full end of the spectrum because the problem is I have an ex-husband who's now been indicated for the second time for um, barging into her therapy or uh, my daughter's therapy, picking up a scissor, pointing at him, previously calling her the C word on a regular basis, pushing her against the wall, kicking her, grabbing her. But you know what? There aren't a lot of people at the upper end of the income spectrum who go through ACS. So he hires Madoff's attorney. He now is flying in someone from Michigan. And there's no support. There's no mm -hmm. one to guide me. And even the matrimonial attorneys don't know what to right. do because they don't have enough clients like me. And there has to be services for somebody like this. And so what he keeps doing is he keeps overturning the indicate. Wait. So let, no, let's take that question. That's a great question. What is? I'm so I think falling it, through the cracks. And more in, importantly, my children are falling so through the cracks. So in terms of the child welfare system, parent advocates will assist any parent who's having a concern. So I don't, you know, the 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 parent advocate role is really cross the board. I mean, we're talking specifically about the child welfare system, and of course there are. There's a need for this kind of client-based peer advocacy in all systems. But in terms of the child welfare system, there's not a designation with the parent advocates. If they're working at an agency, they're going to work with any parent involved with that agency. CWAP's going to work with any parent that has a concern that they bring to them. So we don't um, discriminate based no, on but income it has level. To be someone who's familiar so I think working that's with probably high powered people because right. not, not to the, discriminate well, so, in terms so of So we have to move to the next, but your getting... point is well taken, and I think Can that, I, that's parent um, advocacy. That is part of what CWAP does. There, there is one agency I'd, I could refer her to. I guess I could So you guys should or, connect afterwards. Yeah. Over here? Yeah. Hi, my name is Ariel Sankar Bergman, and I'm an advocate at the Bronx Defenders. And I want to actually tagline on Jennifer Bronson's question because I wasn't sure it was totally answered. And I think it's one of the things that's really challenging about your role of, in terms of being, one, a support for the clients and offering this space where they can come and talk about their issues, but also being a mandated reporter. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm wondering if a client comes to one of your support groups and opens up about a recent relapse or something like that, how do you inform the agency, but then also reestablish trust with that client so that they can still talk to you. And what is, what's it like to sort of navigate that role? And I just wanted to see if you could talk about some of the challenges of that. Right. Um, well, we all know that we are all mandated reporters by all means of ways, right? But how I would navigate through that is I would let the parent know that, yes, I have to report that. Yes, you know, but I will also redirect them as far as treatment to get the help that they need. I will assure them that, you know, they made a mistake, you know, that still pull them up, like not still let them feel down. But yes, I, I have, we have to, we have to report it 
you know, but also for them to get the help that they need so they can better themselves as a person to take care of their family. I think I answered. Dana? I just I think I've seen parent advocates be really effective at negotiating that interaction when they think that there's a safety issue in a way that is supportive of the parents ability <clears throat> to recognize and maybe what they already know in terms of that safety issue so it's certainly a fine line and it's certainly a challenge I think for mm -hmm. for advocates to be in that position but they are um, incredibly um, elegant in the way that they do that Stephanie, when you hire a parent advocate, do you talk about those inherent com I mean, there seems to be an inherent conflict between a confidant on the one hand and being um, the sort of mandated reporter within the system on the other hand. How, what do you say to your parent advocates? I think I definitely have talked about that during interviews. I don't know. Um, but basically negotiating. I'm at, but when you're applying for a position as an advocate, then you know that you're going to need to negotiate certain situations like that. Um, I think that supervision is extremely important um, so that that can be a dialogue and role playing and preparing for situations like that because they do happen. Um, I think that um, that in that situation specifically, it's so important to be honest about the situation that you're in, and it's very empowering to then say, these are the options, this is how we can handle it. Yeah. Um, it's not negotiable, I am a mandated reporter, that's something that should be said at the beginning, and that's a baseline established right. thing, but right. then how can we handle this? This is the information, what are we gonna do? Maybe there are some options you can give the client, and um, that's the kind of thing that would happen during supervision, but hopefully as we're hiring for the position as well, that's something that we should all be mindful of talking about. Okay. All right, who, who has the mic here, right here? Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Haiti Zambrana. I direct a nonprofit organization called Latin Women in Action in Queens. I also work for the Board of Education. I'm here uh, authorized today by the board. S but uh, my question is, um, have you, any of you had a chance, I know that uh, Forestdale does, uh, is in Queens, uh, but the nonprofit organizations that are in Queens, especially uh, the small nonprofits such as uh, the one that I direct, um, have huge problems with the family court system in the sense that uh, we deal with a huge amount of um, immigrants. And um, I have spoken to attorneys who have even sued the city of New York and uh, the system, and they claim that Queens is the worst court in New York City. Um, and especially for immigrants, hundreds and hundreds of people that we service continue to say how their children are removed and remained in the system for many years. Um, as a matter of fact, one experience as a counselor, I went to court to testify for a Hispanic uh, Dominican woman whose child had been removed. And when I testified, the judge said that my testimony uh, was not good because I was not um, uh, licensed uh, to represent the client in court. Yet, here you have, not to offend anyone that works in ACS, but maybe a caseworker who has maybe, I have a master's degree, two master's degrees as a matter of fact, and probably she has a college degree or even a master's as well. Why was her testimony uh, taken and not mine? So, so I would like to uh, find out what your experience, if anyone, and how can we advocate in the system in Queens County because we're lacking and we need support there. I, I have gone to CBWAP, I have some of my staff getting right. training there, but we drastically need help in the borough of Queens. So there's a lot there, there's the issue of immigrants, also this question of credential, credentials, particularly in front of the court. Um, anybody wanna take on either of those? Well, I think in terms of child welfare cases, uh, the Center for Family Representation, if I'm not speaking out of turn, is um, taking responsibility for representing parents in Queens Family Court involved with child welfare system. And so that would, re if I'm accurate, that would be any, any parent, regardless of their background, if they're involved with the child welfare system. And I'll also just say as an aside that the Administration for Children's Services does have a unit specifically focused on immigrant services. So that would be a resource to, to look at as well, if appropriate. Right. 
And I just want to say something else that's yep. a tangent, but in terms of Mr. McCormick's comments earlier, there is a recognition and a lot of work around engaging and supporting fathers, and there is a fatherhood initiative going on through the mayor's office, and ACS is very involved, and the, uh, the Office of Community Partnership is, is doing a lot of work around that. So your point is well taken. Great. All right. Um, unfortunately, we have to move to the next panel. We're already behind. There's be room for a few more questions at the very end. This is to talk about the pressing question that Jim Purcell brought up at the front of the session, which is, when do we actually bring this to scale? In fact, how do we even maintain parent advocacy in the system as it stands now, given the, given the current financing structure? So we have Bill Baccalini, who is director of New York Foundling. Richard Altman, Director of Jewish Child Care Association, and Mabel Hum from the Administration for Children's Services. I guess I, I just want to start, if each of the three of you could just talk a little bit about, first of all, how these positions are being funded currently and what opportunities you see for um, doing that either differently or creatively, et cetera. Bill. Uh, if we told you that, we'd have to kill you, Andrew. Um, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess here's, here's the good news thing. The good news thing is that you don't have to sit around a table any longer and justify the program. In a very few years, everybody at the agency now realizes this is a valuable program. So it's not at the bottom of the list when it comes time to, you know, spreading the nickels around. Having said that, um, it's, it's financially a bit complicated, and you talk about going to scale. I mean, we have a 1,000 kids in care, and I have two parent advocates. Well, you know what? There are probably a lot of parents in our care who need the help of a parent advocate who aren't getting it, right? And then there are some agencies without parent advocates. So it's complicated from a financial standpoint. A couple of things. Um, IOC, and I don't, I'm, I'll try to stay away from as many acronyms. I, I don't like the acronyms myself. But a few years ago, when things we were a little bit better off financially, the system, there was enough flexibility that when, when the parent advocate position was established, we were able to fund it. Well, fast forward now, things aren't going so well in the city. You heard Ma uh, Commissioner Mattingly reference that, and uh, Jim referenced that. Um, we're currently funding it, and I know Richie's funding it the same way, um, reinvestment. You know, the city hasn't weighed in on if, whether that's appropriate, but I, my guess is after this morning's. Um, if, if, they, if they view it as not appropriate, I'm going to get you all to come down to 150 William Street. Because, uh, quite frankly, and here's now, why... Now I've got to kill Bill. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, the issue, the issue, is, the issue is this. We, we, we think we can justify funding it out of reinvestment because we tie the work of parent advocates to permanency. Right? This is no longer, this isn't a luxury any longer, folks. I think these jobs have actually revealed to thick-headed people like myself that there was always something missing. There was always something missing. And now the issue is, how do we get it to scale? So I'll let Richie, there are options. Well, how much, but how much money is there in reinvestment for an agency? I mean, uh, you're one of the largest foster care agencies. Uh, yeah, right? and so there's, not a, there's not a lot. Not there's, a lot. And the MSAR stuff, and Commissioner Carrion deserves a ton of credit for changing the reg. But you know what? In this environment, it doesn't really help us because the city's not at the MSAR because of its own fiscal issues. So I can spend the money, and it'll get calculated up in Albany, but I won't see it because we're, I don't want to tell you how far off the MSAR, but it'll be, let's hope in our lifetime, um, we would see it fold itself into our rate. So that's, right. that's right. while a good structural change really over the short term is not right. going to have Just an impact. Just for those of you who don't, how many of you know what MSAR is? You want to give up. Okay. Uh, Two cents. You don't um, have to go into detail, but okay, it's the right. rate that uh, okay, is here's what it is. Um, uh, the st actually, Jim Purcell developed some years ago, about 30, about 30 years ago, this, th this way of figuring out how much a foster care agency should get for providing care, whether it be residential care or overseeing the uh, provision of foster boarding home care. It's a two-year lag. So Jewish Child Care Agency spends the dollar today. And then two years later, Jewish Child Care Agency finds that dollar in its rate and it gets reflected in the rate. Well, that all, that's great when the, a, when the city is paying what the rate is. But, the, but if the city's not paying the rate, that dollar then only widens the gap between what the city is paying and what we are actually spending. Good, that's great. Sorry. Richie. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I first, I first want to say, uh, sitting here listening to this presentation, um, and I, I particularly want to thank uh, the parent advocates and the agencies who presented because I, I was inspired. This was an inspiring presentation and uh, really, uh, I think, provides a lift for those of us doing this everyday work that really are feeling beleaguered and battered by what's going on. So thank you. In relation to financing, I want to make a, a I want to say public, uh, I'll make a public, I, I'm sorry, David. I, I, I want to say I finally forgive you. <laughs> now, David has no idea what I'm talking about, so I want to talk about financing. In 1991, 1991, long before the inception of the project in New York, Jewish Child Care Association hired our first three parent advocates. Where did that come from? It came from an internal strategic planning study that basically said, we are doing a lousy job engaging the biological parents that come to our door because they come to our door involuntarily. And many of you who've been touched by the system know that many of the first contact that families have with our system starts with the following sound. <laughs> All right, I mean recognition. I went to social work school. How many social workers in the room? So we, they teach us about engagement, starting where the client is, having the client tell their story, creating a safe space. That ain't child welfare. Child welfare starts with an accusation. You're accused. You are not a partner. We're not with you, we're judging you. I don't care what the rhetoric is, that's how it all starts, because very few engagements wind up going to family court when you have voluntary agreements. So in a very profound strategic planning process, we came to the conclusion that we were lousy at the engagement because we were no different in the mind of the biological family coming in than ACS. How do we break through that? And we created an idea that said, let's hire parents. And the difference that I heard today, we only hired parents that were done with our system, that had gotten their children back, were graduates, and really, really were seen as people that can then say, I use the experience. The person that was sitting here before from NAC, we had a person just like you that we all hid when she came into the office. <laughs> Today's visiting day, run and hide. And the bottom line was she became an amazingly lead parent partner. We don't like to use the word parent advocate because we want to create a different kind of relationship. Parent partners are there to aid because they have to report, they have to follow the rules, etc. But they tell families the real deal and the engagement ability is so much faster and so much more real. So how do we finance it? There was no reinvestment money when we started. We went to foundations. We went to our board. We said, here's an idea. We want to run with it. Give us some cash. We'll give you a better outcome. So we did not rely on the public dollar from the beginning. Yes, we become created and used investment money as we've gone along. And investment money is a, is a trap in some ways because you only get investment money when you hit the goals. So you're expending money up front on the supposition you're going to hit your performance goals. And if you don't, the kind of hemorrhaging that we're all experiencing in terms of overall funding reductions becomes a ma major problem for us. We have had upwards of 20 parent partners since 1991. And the nice part about education is we've invested in education for some of those people. And they have gone on to become regular staff members in other roles. Foster parent partner. Home finding worker. Nobody does home finding better than people that have been through the system, trust me. There's antenna and there's radar. So money is really important, and foundation partners and private money got us off the ground. But once you get off the ground and have a successful product, now you have something you can go and try to sell further. Right. So I'll stop there. Okay, great. Mabel Holm, you want to comment on that? Hi, good morning. Um, well, I came here this morning uh, with all anticipation that we were uh, on the track of reinvestment money, uh, funding these uh, parent advocate. Uh, and I was surprised to hear uh, when Commissioner Clarion said that um, they were funded through the MSAR. So uh, all I can say is that I'm going to go back to my office and research that further. 
um, but we are coming out with um, a memo on the reinvestment program where uh, we will be listing uh, uh, eligible services that uh, can be funded with uh, parent, you know, be funding for the parent advocate. Mm -hmm. So, um, so is there is there a benefit to the policy that says parent advocate contacts with parents count towards your performance evaluation towards your goals? Does that help with reinvestment money directly, or is it? Yeah, I. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, we're going to. I, I think thing. I think there's a definite connection. Mm -hmm. The more you can engage. The more you can create the kind of permanent, safe, successful outcomes and permanency planning, mm -hmm. the better you'll do on, on reinvestment relative to the goals. So yes, there is a direct connection. Although I would, I would reiterate what Bill said, and I want to make sure you do your studies. For many agencies, the MSAR is above the performance-based rate that the city is at right now. And therefore, in terms of real dollars, it, it really does not make a difference in the MSAR methodology. That's interesting. You know, something that didn't come up in the earlier conversations, but I do think is a positive unintended consequence of now including them in the contacts is a, a bunch of you talked about the culture differences, like a parent advocate coming into an agency and the caseworkers are, hey, I'm not so sure. You know, are you my friend? Are you my foe? You don't want to be a case aide, right? That's not what you're there, you're there for. You're there to advocate for the uh, families. But you may not like their motivation, but Caseworkers now are going to be a little bit more wide open, knowing that your contacts with their families count against the total casework. So their motivations may not be as pure as the driven snow, but you don't care, right? I mean, as long as as long as we're in the system and we're working toward the same end. So I right. think that that's a positive right. consequence. Are there other policy changes, sort of fundamental policy changes that would make this work easier, not only on the financing side, but more broadly in terms of employing parent advocates? Um, I, you know, th this whole discussion of, um, and Commissioner Manningly couldn't get into many details today about preventive services and where we currently are and the utilization issues that are, that are, that are, that he's up against and we as agencies are up against, but the way preventive services are funded, um, and for those folks who don't know, it's, I mean, you, you have a, a thousand slots. This is how much you get, a thousand slots. This is the prescribed length of stay. If you get, if you, if you get your full money, if you get them out on, you know, a pre, uh, predetermined uh, amount of time or uh, across the agency on an average. But the way they're funded actually gives me reason to be a little optimistic that we could actually use that approach in funding um, uh, parent partners, as now um, um, Richie calls them. So I'm going to go back, and we're going to uh, we're going to start to think about that. But I think that that provides us the foster care stuff is much more complicated because it's involved in the per diem with a two year lag, and it's much harder for that dollar to get in and stay in the system. But preventive services offers us an opportunity that I don't think we probably thought yeah, about before that's today. That's an interesting angle. I mean, I wonder is there a take within. CWAP, for example, around advocating for this and pushing it. I want to get Mike. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. You know, it's, it's like really encouraging today to hear like all the support that's being expressed for the parent advocate movement, and, but to some extent, you know, we're, we're preaching to the choir in here, and outside of here, it's a somewhat different story, and right. there's really a lot of pushback. Turn it so that you're talking straight into oh, it. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. And, and there's really a lot of pushback against um, the parent advocate movement in, in the world outside of this auditorium, in the larger world outside of this auditorium. Um, ACS has this community partnership project, which, um, I think it is a wonderful concept and, and, and has a world of potential. Um, there are a lot of people who feel that the community representatives who are employed through the project, um, that it's not important that they have life experience with ACS, mm -hmm. that it's almost preferable that they don't because uh, people who don't, um, are, they're less emotional and, and um, they're, um, they're more compliant with, um, with the people who are supervising them. Uh, they, they bring less personal baggage to the position. The, these are some of the rationales that I've heard. Um, that um, you can't be a parent advocate and be sufficiently focused on child safety, which is garbage. Those two things are by no means mutually exclusive. Um, you can be a very strong parent advocate, and sometimes the best way to protect children is by helping and strengthening their families, in most cases, I, I, I would venture to say. So, um, 
you know, my, my feeling is, is, our feeling is, is that community partnership project could be a vehicle for spreading parent advocacy throughout the city um, through parents acting in these roles of community representatives. And, you know, we'll just, um, we're, we're just going to have to keep making that argument until mm -hmm. it becomes something closer to a reality. Right. Thanks. You know, we, uh, Andrew, and I would say this to the folks in the audience, please, I mean, if, if we are going to get this to scale, our best opportunity is while John Manningly is commissioner. I mean, he actually believes this stuff very, very strongly. And, you know, I'm not so sure how much time is left, but he's got to be getting tired. So um, my guess is it's uh, uh, a couple of years at best. So let's, let's come together and push this hard now. All right, so, yeah, I, I, just wanna, I just want to uh, second Mike Arsham's point. We're a member of the Community Partnership of Bridge Builders in the Bronx. And a number of our uh, parent partners have come through recruiting through Bridge Builders community-based agencies. Because those agencies are on the ground. They know what people want to be advocates. They know what people have passion to make a difference. And they have given us good people. So right. I, I think that's a great point. Most of the community partnerships are not following your lead. Mike just says most of the partnerships aren't following that lead. Um, so now is time for 15 minutes of questions, both for the panel and for some of the experts who are also in the room. Um, over there, and then over here, and then Rolando, if you really want to come over here. Yep. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My I name know. is Sally Jackson, and I am an ex-community rep. And the only way, first, let me thank Commissioner Mattingly. Yep for changing um, BCW to <laughs> CWA and ACS to stop snatching children without having a little bit more compassion. I really appreciate that, Commissioner, and I wanted to say that to you. Um, I am a, a community rep who has experience in the child welfare system, having a child taken away. And what I want to know from the panel, and whoever can answer this question for me, is I only heard about the parent advocacy through a classmate, which was Felicia, as I was working as a community rep. And it seemed that as I'm sitting at the table with the parent and the ACS caseworkers and the um, parent advocate, the parent advocate didn't know of my role. I was brought in through ACS as the community rep and the parent advocate was brought in through the agency representing or the child and the family. And we're sitting at the table together, not knowing what each other's roles were. So I want to know, has that changed within the past year? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, well, let's, um, who? Okay, I think that's just something to table here. For, oh, Sandra Killett. Oh, Dana. Okay. Well, I, I would say that maybe one way that that may be evolving is as um, ACS has rolled out the improved outcomes for children, where it was started in certain pilot agencies, and then it's going system wide. That you know, the more agencies that are involved with that and getting familiar with the community rep and that whole process, mm -hmm. that that may happen. But okay. certainly across the system, unfortunately, everyone doesn't always know everything right. that's going on. It's a good point. All right, so. Let's ask a string of questions really quickly. Please keep them to just two or three sentences each. Thanks. Okay, thank you. This is actually just an important comment that while we're working on capacity building of parent advocates, it's important to remember that there can be a very strong collaboration with the family resource centers across the city. There's actually nine family resource centers across the city. They're all funded by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And they're all staffed by family advocates, youth advocates, and they are all staff members that have been through their own personal experience and can really assist and partner up and offer that peer advocacy to parents. So while you're How trying to- How do people to, find out about those? Um, you can call 311. Um, you can go on, uh, on LifeNet, 1-800-LIFENET. Um, you can go on the, um, the DOHMH website and get um, the information for, your, for the particular family resource center nearest the family. 
Um, so it's very accessible, very uh, easy to find. But you don't have to be involved in the mental health system to No, not it, necessarily. Right? Okay. Uh, the, the kind of families that we provide services for are families that have young people, children between the ages of zero to 24 years of age that, ha that are currently experiencing emotional or behavioral challenges or are at risk of developing a mental health need. Okay, so great. when we talk about youngsters at risk, we're talking about you know all the families that we're all working with. Okay. So again, have to move to the reminder. next person. But thank thank you. you. Good morning. My name is Rolando Bini. I'm the director of Parents in Action. We are an organization that works uh, for uh, system change advocacy, and also we provide full services, family preservation services, both in Spanish and English. I have two questions. One is that uh, in order for the parent advocates to be recognized by the family court, uh, most family court judges do not recognize parent advocates and rather they exclude them. Uh, what do we need to do so parent advocates can be recognized by the court as the same level as caseworkers? Uh, because they are the ones who know most about the case than anybody else there sitting there, particularly the attorneys who have very little information about the case except for legal terms. Uh, so we need to, maybe the Office of Court Administration should recognize them. The second thing is, uh, I want to reinforce what my Arshan said. Uh, uh, there is a competition right now in the CPPs, the Community Partnership Projects. They have excluded for practical purposes the parent advocates. And I think it's wrong. When there is a family team conference or a high-risk uh, emergency uh, team conference for, for a child, both the parent advocate and the community representative should be called because they sh there should be no competition. I think parent, uh, parent advocates are the best person because the parents will trust them the most, not the community representative, which could be a good intention, right. but he doesn't have a clue what, what goes on. But the, the, I just want to add also that we do work with a lot of immigrants. We are in Queens, and we do have a parent advocate training. It takes six months. Our next training will be a start in, in May. It's open, so we, we, are, we also have a circle of support for parents, and also we have full services, including parenting skills for children with a special needs. Thank you. So we're hoping to do a, a forum like this on the community partnerships later this year, and that'll certainly be one of the issues. And certain in other states, that in fact is part of the process, in fact, like in the child safety conferences, of having a community rep and a parent advocate in as many of the child safety conferences as they Andrew, can. I just I just wanted to comment real quick about yep. the family court. As you know, family court judges are, are kings of the kingdom. Yep. And they are very variable in who they will allow to come and give testimony, including parent advocates in many cases where they believe they have the best information. Right. But it's not a uniform situation right. for right. sure. Well, literally, we only have time for two more people. So it, if, if you have one sentence to give, because I really want to get a couple, yes, couple of people. Yes, quickly. I just want to thank my cousin Shamika for being here. Um, um, it's great to see you. Uh, I just, I'm, uh, it's very important. I'm, I'm, in support, I'm in support of housing. And um, they did a home visit on me Monday, and I yep. passed the home visit. But the thing is, I got to look for a two-bedroom for my, uh, my son. I heard they talk about the, the shelters and things like that, but I haven't heard anybody bring up about how, how to help a parent that's trying to get their son home or the kid home right. with apartments, you know right. what I'm saying, for housing. You know, and that's, that's the only thing. That's the only thing. Yes, that's the only thing yeah. um, a huge that I'm challenge. worried about. Yeah. Right. Okay, In two more to people quickly, home. and then we can round up okay. to the next. Uh, just a thought regarding financing for the parent advocate position. Office of Mental Health has tried to finance the parent advocates within our waiver programs through our uh, Medicaid waiver, so using Medicaid dollars. I don't know if that's a possibility for the foster care system, possibly through Bridges to Health, mm -hmm. but um, just, a, just a thought as far as mm -hmm. a way of making the uh, parent advocate position financially sustainable. Mabel, do you have any sense of whether that would be feasible? Well, the waiver program is funded through the Department of Health, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we don't have access to that money. We just send... Uh, candidates there. Okay. I mean, the B, uh, for those that are in B2H, it certainly would be permissible. The problem, if you're a non-B2H, and that's still the majority of the system, mm -hmm. until, until OMH formally recognizes home visits, that will be a difficult thing to pull off. Interesting like point. So Bridges right. to Health is uh, one of the sort of bridges between the mental health system and the child welfare system that includes Medicaid funding. Right. Yep. Hi, my name is Gail Mercedes. I'm a family advocate for the 
Family Resource Center, Northern Manhattan. Um, I have a comment. I understand that with finances, um, people look at outcomes and the bottom line. Um, when it comes, from my experience as a parent, family advocate, um, and other family advocates I've worked with, uh, when a family, I call them a family, not a client, <laughs> when a family has a family advocate, uh, their goals, you know, when we help, we work with the family to, you know, search for their goals, what their goals are, we, and as with the caseworkers or other, you know, providers, we, of course, some things they have to comply with or, <laughs> Uh, you know, do, mm -hmm. but um, if the family, uh, if we support them, they do uh, comply with those goals and they do, right. you know, we've, I've experienced that. Great. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, one more comment quickly and then I'm going to introduce our final speaker. Okay, I can speed talk. So, I'm Euphemia Adams, I'm the Executive Director for Families on the Move of New York City. We are a nonprofit organization. We are family members, and we developed our own organization to service families. We provide parenting classes for children of special needs, and we also do cross systems work. So it's important that we collaborate together as families, and also the terminology is important, like um, Gail said, it's important that we're reflected as families and not clients or cases. Right. Thank you. All right, thanks. So uh, our, our final speaker to wrap things up, we're going to run a little bit long, so don't everybody leap up and leave. Um, and well, thank you for this panel. Um, our final speaker is Jeremy Kohamban, who is the executive director of Children's Village. Two years ago, just before the Parent Advocates Initiative got started, he closed this, the session that uh, kicked this off, and we wanted to come back to him as we finish the second year. Jeremy. Yeah, I'm not going to keep you long. That's the good news. And uh, you can't repeat something you did two years ago and get it right again. So if Anita is here, I'm sorry, this is not going to be inspirational. You, you've had all the inspiration you needed from the panelists that, uh, and the speakers here, especially from Mr. Baccalini and Richie Altman. Did Richie, Richie walk out? Is that money in your bag, funding? Uh, let, let me tell you, I, I've been involved with Parent Advocates uh, since 1989. It was the first job I did, and I remember meeting uh, David. First job in child welfare, and it has impacted my life greatly. Um, I'll tell you three things that I've learned, and you heard them all here today, but I'll just remind you as you walk out the door. Despite our good intentions, the personal commitment and the honorable convictions that bring us to this work as Richie mentioned, foster care is incredibly intrusive. It's isolating and it's inherently terrifying to the families we serve. Don't get me wrong, foster care is important. And without foster care, without a strong foster care system, children will be hurt. So I'm not one of the lunatic fringe that says eliminate foster care. That's not what I'm saying. But unfortunately, our mandates, our professional training, our personal identities, and even our altruistic, uh, even the altruistic reasons that bring us to this work creates a barrier between us and those that we commit to help. Those are the families. Parents in professional roles as equal partners is the only consistent bridge that I have found that reduces the fear between us and parents and brings us closer together. Second, funding is always difficult. But as organizational leaders, we are constantly advocating for what we need, and we are constantly making choices about how we spend our limited financial resources. We have the power to invest in what we believe is important. We do. Commissioners John Mattingly and Gladys Carrion made sure that some of the visits that foster parents make count. They made that happen. That would not have happened had the not two, without the two of them coming together. That's true on the private side, too. Agency leaders, with the help of progressive foundations, can and should make that commitment, too. Many of, as you can see from those who were here today, and you end up preaching to the choir anyway, many of us have made that decision, and we love it. 
It's one of the best things that have happened to us. And Mike is right. Many have not even begun to. My guess is that those that choose not to do this do so because it's the organizational leaders believe that parents have nothing to contribute to the work we do. It's got to be. It's got to be. Boy, they don't make this a, ch a church service now. <laughs> Finally, I am, I am convinced that I will never know the true excitement of this work until our organizations are overflowing with parents and youth who are embedded in our day-to-day -day struggle. It's not easy to do, and it requires the commitment from the highest levels in the organization. Personally, at the Children's Village, that includes my trustees. They, too, have to buy into this because they are the ones that allow me to do what we do, and they fund a lot of what we do. It takes time, and it's completely frustrating at times. And Sandra is not looking at me right now because she can be frustrating to me sometimes. I know that even today, right now, it is very possible that there's a parent at the doorstep of a children's village program that does not feel welcome. I get that. That's the system that I own, and I alone am responsible for the tone and the culture of that organization. But I know that with parents, it becomes a little easier. So I'm going to give a shout out to the people that make it work for me every day. Some of you are here. Julia, Paula, Shamel, Teresa, Renee, Paulette, Tamika, Sandra, Peggy, Lisa. Tamika and Josefina are youth advocates. You know, you, we are good, but you make us greater. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. I hope you can take something useful away from this and I hope we can reconvene around a system five times as big as this a few years from now. <laughs> <laughs>